Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode focuses on the projects and culture of professional effective altruism, what's good about them and also how they could be better. If you haven't heard of effective altruism, you may well want to listen to episode 17 with Will McCaskill or episode 21 with Holden Karnofsky to help set the scene, as we don't really stop to explain what it is. This interview was actually recorded at EA Global London four months ago, and in the meantime, Stefan has moved on from being a researcher at the Centre for Effective Altruism to being a researcher at the Social Behaviour and Ethics Lab, a moral psychology research team at Oxford University. And just a reminder that if you enjoy this discussion, you can join very similar conversations by going to an EA Global event yourself. The next one is in San Francisco at the start of June, and you can learn more and apply at eaglobal.org. Without further ado, I bring you Dr. Stefan Schubert. Today, I'm speaking with Stefan Schubert. Stefan is a researcher at the Center for Effective Altruism, which is the larger organization that 80,000 Hours is a part of. Prior to joining CEA, he was a postdoc in philosophy at the London School of Economics, during which time he also did a range of outreach to promote rationality in politics, a noble if uh, difficult uh, goal in the the modern age. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Stefan. Thank you, Rob. I'm very happy to be here. We plan to talk about your views on where the effective altruism movement should go. But first, let's talk about epistemic modesty, which is something CEA has been writing about lately. What's the issue there? Well, I mean, I guess one theme is just this, like, you know, general realization that humans naturally are overconfident and we need to compensate for that. And it's like something that you sort of say to yourself over and over again, but like to to really act in that humble and modest way. I, I certainly don't think that I do that myself. And like, you know, in the moment you might think that like, well, I actually have good evidence for this, but then you look back on at your own decisions and you realize that, hey, I actually, you know, acted very overconfident. And, and I guess that the modesty aspect is also respecting the opinions of other people and yeah. realizing that even yeah. if you're, you feel very confident, yeah, that, yeah, right, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that you are. This is a very topical subject right now. There's, there's been this discussion, you know, online between like Gregory Lewis and others about like how modest should one actually be. Yeah, and I, I broadly adopt Greg's approach there that one, one should defer to others. But I think that's like... It's one thing to say, but like, I, I don't think I actually live up to that. I was thinking about it, that I was having these discussions with, with Greg about this uh, and Pablo Staffarini about like, what would it actually look like if I actually acted on this? And I, I think I would behave quite differently. It feels a bit like the um, epistemic equivalent of becoming a monk. It's like, uh, you know, eschewing all right. of your own views yeah, and yeah, just yeah, like yeah. Yeah, to adopting a completely different lifestyle. I mean, I guess there was this nice distinction that came up in that piece, which was this between like, you know, your private signal or someone uh, proposed the name impressions, like which was like what it, you, know, you felt that you had evidence for. And then there was like this all things considered uh, belief that you had, like, you know, after you had like deferred to others and that perhaps we should call that our belief and the, you know, the first thing, our impressions. And that we should sort of like systematically use these two terms in discussions, like, you know, my impression is X, but my belief is Y. Mm. So, uh, and in that way, like, you know, if you do that, then you don't have to become a monk, as it were, because you can actually tell people your impressions. But yeah. then when you actually act, well, then you, you do have to be a monk, as it were. I'll put up uh, links to the various uh, blog posts that have been written about this recently, uh, representing different views of uh, you know how modest one ought to be and how much one ought to defer to others and how much uh, one should trust one's own judgment. So people can have a look at that and, and decide for themselves. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you should. I mean, I, I was really happy with this discussion because it was really like this like high-level intellectual discussion that we want to see more of in EA, I think. So you mentioned that people have some misconceptions about what people at the Center for Effective Altruism believe. Well, what are some of those? Yeah, I think this like long-term focus is something that people haven't really grasped to the, the extent to which we think that's a priority. I mean, I think another thing is this with donations versus direct work. So like initially EA was heavily associated with donations and now the funding situation has become much better. And like Ben Todd, the, the CEO of 80,000 Hours, he wrote already two years ago this great blog post about like how we should focus on talent gaps rather than funding gaps. And he also predicted that the situation would be even more loopsided 
uh, you know, going forward. And, and I mean, now we can see that he was right. Yeah. But it still seems that this is, hasn't really got across. So we should de-emphasize donations. We should also de-emphasize uh, earning to give. Yeah, that's something that 80,000 Hours has been writing about a bit because we, yeah. we have basically the, the, the same issue. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic that it can take years for your initial message to get across. And then if you ever change your mind or the situation changes, it, it yeah. takes years to communicate that, that things are, are different now. Yeah, I was thinking like, why is that it, that it takes so much time? I think like, you know, if the British Labour Party like changes their mind, you know, which they did with Tony Blair, like, you, you know, with New Labour and so on, it doesn't take that long time. But I, I guess we don't have like quite the same amount of like information. It's like, you know, people don't write about yeah. EA in like daily media. So, so therefore it takes time. Yeah. I suppose the thing is we're working on this all the time. So we know what people think yeah. and how their views change. Yeah. But, if, but if you're only paying a bit of yeah. attention, then yeah. Yeah. You, if you're not reading every day about what our views are, then of course you don't keep track of it like that. Yeah. So uh, before you were working at CEA, uh, what exactly were you doing? Are you doing this work on rationality in politics and you're at the London School of Economics. How was that? Yeah. Yeah, so I did my PhD in Sweden in formal epistemology in Lund in southern Sweden, and then I came to to London School of Economics to to continue the studies. And then I found out about EA actually via Less Wrong in 2014, and I got quite rapidly got got into it more and more. And I, I went to EAG or EA Summit, I think it was called then in in the summer of 2014. And then, like, my first thought was like, hey, this is this great concept, but I hadn't really, like, grasped the extent to which, like, people who were involved had not only that sort of, like, general broad concept of, like, doing good effectively, but they also had, like, lots of specific ideas about how you did good. So instead I went, like, well, you know, given that there is this concept and it seems good. Like, what what can I do with like my experiences uh, and my my special competences? And then I thought that well, on the one hand, I have this like training in rationality and epistemology, and on the other hand, I also have this interest in in politics. Um, I also studied political science, and I was also always interested in like you know what would it be like if like politicians were actually truthful in election debates and you know said relevant things. You're, so, a, you're a dreamer, Stefan. Yeah, <laughs> people have said that. <laughs> um, so then I started um, this um, blog in Swedish uh, on something that I call argument checking. So, you know, there's fact checking. Mm -hmm. But then I went like, well, there are so many other ways in which you can sort of like deceive people except you know, outright lying. Uh, so that was that was fairly fun in a way. Like I had this South African friend uh, at LSE whom I uh, told about this, uh, that I was like, you know, pointing out fallacies uh, which people made. And so she was like, that suits you perfectly. You're so judgy. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think there's something to that. Uh, so that was one project I had. And then there was also like, I was impressed by these like, groups working on evidence-based policy in the US and the UK. And I went like, well, we don't have anything like this in Sweden. So I started a, a similar uh, network for evidence-based policy. And then I also created this political bias test uh, at Clear Thinking. I think you had Spencer Greenberg from Clear Thinking uh, at your show before. And we got that published in Vox. And like, Spencer is excellent at sort of getting his stuff out there. Uh, so yeah, all of this was lots of fun and I like got some traction, but then when there were these positions at CEA, uh, in like in the fall of uh, 2015, I decided to, you know, apply for them. And th that was when my postdoc was, was running up. So then I started working uh, with Global Priorities Project on, on policy because I had that policy background. So what kinds of things did you did you try to do? I remember you you had fact checking this live fact checking on yeah, on but that that is yeah, but actually that is yeah. We might have called it fact checking at some point, but you know the name which I wanted to use was argument checking. So mm -hmm. that was okay. like in addition to fact checking, we also checked arguments. Did, did you get many people uh, watching your live argument checking? Yeah, I mean in Sweden I got some traction. I, I guess I had probably hoped for more people to read about this but on the plus side i think that the sort of like the very top showed at least some interest in it so it was like a, a smaller interest in uh, than what i thought but at least you know you reach the most influential people 
Yeah, I, I guess my my doubt about this strategy would be obviously you can fact check politicians and right. you can argument check them. Yeah, but how much do people care? How much do voters really care? And and even if they yeah. were to read the site, how much would it change their mind about about anything? Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's fair. I think uh, one approach which one might take would be to sort of like following up on this experience that, you know, the very top people who write opinion pieces for, for newspapers and so on, they were at least interested in and just double down on that and like try, try to reach them. So I think that something that people think is that, okay, so there are like the tabloids and so on. And they, I mean, everyone agrees that, you know, what they're saying is generally not that good. Uh, but then you go to the sort of the highbrow papers and then everything there would actually make sense. And I, I think, so, so that was what I did. I went for sort of like the, the Swedish equivalent of, you know, somewhere between the Guardian and the Telegraph or so. So like, you know, uh, a decently well-respected paper. And even there you can point out this like glaring fallacy if, if you dig it a bit deeper. You mean that journalists are just messing up? Yeah, or like here it was often also like outside writers, like uh, yeah, politicians or civil servants or so. So I think potentially if you could sort of get people who are a bit more influential and more well respected to realize like how careful you actually have to be in order to really get to the truth. It's just to take one subject that effective altruists are very interested in, like you know all the writings about AI. Mm -hmm where you get people like professors who are writing uh, articles which are really very poor uh, mm. on this extremely important subject. And it's, it's just outrageous if you think about it. Yeah. To be honest, when I read those articles, I imagine we're referring to, to similar things. Right. I'm just, I'm astonished and I don't know how to react because I read it and I can just see egregious errors and yeah. egregious misunderstandings. Yeah. But then we've got this modesty issue yeah. uh, that... That you're bringing up before, these are well-respected people, at least within yeah. their fields that that are kind yeah. of adjacent areas. And then I'm thinking, am I the crazy one? Like, uh, do yeah. they read what I write, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. and they have the same reaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't feel that, so I probably <laughs> reveal my immodesty. <laughs> I mean, there is. I mean, of course, you should be modest if people sort of show some signs and, and like. like uh, of like reasonableness and obviously like you know if someone is arguing for a position that you know your prior that is true it's very low but like you know they're a reasonable person and they're arguing for it well then you should update but like if they are arguing in a way uh, which is like you know very emotive they're not even like responding to they're not really addressing the positions that we are holding for instance then I don't think modesty is the right approach I guess it does uh, go to show how difficult being modest is when the rubber really hits the road and you're just <laughs> sure about something, but, but someone else suspected kind of disagrees. But but I agree, there is a real red flag when people don't seem to be actually engaging with the with the yeah. substance of, of the issues, which yeah. uh, happens surprisingly often. Yeah. And they, they'll write something which just suggests, oh, I just don't like the tone or I don't like this topic or this whole thing makes me kind of mad, but they can't explain why exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you've been involved in effective altruism for a couple of years now. How has your view changed as you've gotten to know it better? And, and I guess, how, how do you think effective altruism is actually changing itself? Right. Thanks. Uh, okay. So let me focus on the second part first. So I think, well, Robin Hanson called EA Youth Movement in 2015, uh, I think. Uh, I'll put up a link to, to that blog post where he, he, he characterizes us that way. That's a very Hansonian way of characterizing something, <laughs> you might think. Uh, and he said that we were all about signaling and so on, which I'm sure is true. He has a great book, by the way, coming out on this subject. I much recommend reading it. So anyway, he, he called us uh, a youth movement. And I think there was a lot to that. I still think there's something to that. But I think that effective altruism is gradually growing up. And I think there's like this big push now towards like expertise and specialization. Uh, like obviously you at ATK are like coaching lots of people to go into specialist fields like in AI safety and AI strategy and biosecurity. I think, well, we share offices with Future Humanity Institute. Uh, uh, it's a great institution. And I think during the time I've been at the CEA for nearly two years now, I've, I've seen FHI changing uh, quite a bit that they get more subject matter experts and like you know the, the proportion of these like big picture philosophy thinkers is, is uh, decreasing 
So I think this is really important to to develop expertise in order to get influence also. So the, like the effective altruist concept itself is is not enough to get people to listen to you. You, you also need to demonstrate expertise in specific areas. And I, I think we're really good at that in existential risk uh, in particular. Uh, and I think that's really crucial in order to, to get people to, to listen to us. And relatedly, I think there is like a strong focus on quality. Uh, now, uh, EA is a very intellectual uh, movement or community. And I think in intellectual matters, the very best are disproportionately impactful. So like someone like Nick Bostrom, just it's like many orders of magnitude more important than uh, like an average professor. Uh, and this like leads us to focus on them. And I think this is uh, absolutely right. It, it, it follows from our like general focus on, on impact. So that's one way that EA seems to be getting better. Uh, what are some ways that you think uh, we might be going wrong or, or could even be getting worse? I'm not sure I have some aspect uh, where we're getting worse. Okay. I think many things are actually going in the right di- direction, but then you can discuss whether they're, they're, they're changing fast enough. So one thing is that like it, it's often been uh, pointed out uh, that there are clear analogies between effective altruism and sort of profit-seeking companies. Uh, so like in market economies, companies try to maximize effectiveness, uh, whereas charities typically don't do that. But like, you know, EA tries to, to sort of apply this sort of like uh, effectiveness mindset to, to charities. Therefore, I think we can, we can borrow many insights which uh, economists have made from like the market economy and, and sort of use them to, uh, to understand our own activities. And, and, and one of them is this like Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction. How like in capitalist societies, you know, someone might have invested a lot in uh, acquiring a certain skill and then, you know, you have a new technology and that skill is not really useful anymore. And when capitalism uh, developed, many people were sort of complaining about that. Well, you know, there are all these craftsmen who have these skills and now they're not useful anymore. And they were sort of romanticizing this. And like similarly, I think in, in EA, uh, you should expect a lot of creative destruction. That And especially now we're still at the beginning, like we're, we're finding new ways of doing good and like new dimensions along which you can do good better. So we should then uh, expect that we need to sort of throw out mm-hmm. the old ways of doing things. And I worry a bit that we're not doing that fast enough. And that, I mean, of course, one difference that you have still is that in a market economy, you get like very clear feedback. You know, if no one wants to buy your product, you, you, you will go bankrupt. Whereas in EA, someone might not have much of an impact, but it's not as visible. So then you might go then on doing things in the old way. They can amble on and donors aren't aware that yeah, their resources yeah. are not being used very well. Yeah, yeah. So you worry that maybe we're not shutting down enough projects, basically. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then we could, of course, like take those resources and use them some other way. Yeah. You know, there's money on that, people. Yeah. I I think uh, we at CEA, we've become a bit better at this. We, we have shut down some projects uh, recently, but I'm sure we can improve. And I think the, the community as a whole can improve here. And I think this is also like, uh, sometimes it almost feels like, you know, some people get a bit disappointed, like, oh, I like that thing. Like, you know, why, why we're we not doing that thing anymore? But like, th- that's just what you should expect if you're really having an impact. Like if we're never changing anything fundamentally, then we're doing something wrong. So there should be a lot of creative destruction. Yeah. A lot of people uh, won't remember this, but 80,000 hours had this whole membership uh process at the at the beginning and, and also a pledge where people would say that they would do a whole lot of good with their career and we ended up cutting that because it was just taking a huge amount of time and we didn't think it was accomplishing very much i suppose we haven't gone the the, the full radical way and just shut down eighty thousand hours because we don't think it's useful but we have we have changed our focus a bit over the years yeah and you know other parties have been shut down so yeah so can you give a few examples of things that you've uh, maybe changed your mind about since you since you first got involved with vector altruism in 2014 um, yeah, so I think one thing is this like an underestimation of the importance of, of the very best, which I mean, I, I guess I share with, with many others, but I, I just think that, yes, yeah, the very best, not only in terms of competence, but also sort of in terms of 
willingness to to change uh, and like to really go for something that's re- really important and yeah I, I think that is really a key insight i also think that to some extent i've been over optimistic about some causes other than uh, existential risk uh, such as like institutional change and broad policy change i probably thought that we would have, have accomplished more in other course areas by now and we, we haven't really and potentially that's because we've sort of invested so much in existential risk so, so you mean you, you used to be more optimistic about institutional reform and yeah been, do, and you think that's maybe because the problem was harder than we thought or just that we haven't focused on it yeah that's uh, that's the question that i'm asking myself but probably it's to a significant extent that's harder than one thinks. I'd like, and I also think that I did this like typical. I committed this uh, typical mind fallacy where I was like, "Oh, to me, EA is so obvious, and why, you know, and everyone should apply this." And, and, and that's just not the case. So. Yeah, uh, you're not the first to be a little bit <laughs> <laughs> too optimistic about how easy yeah. it is to change things. And um, then another thing is that, like, I thought that there would be more orcs by now and i think this is also something that many people thought that they 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 saw that you know initially lots of organizations were formed in ea and then they just thought that 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 development would would continue and it, it hasn't really some organizations you might think have grown fairly fairly dominant uh, uh, like open philanthropy project and n80 thousand hours and others and i think actually that's one reason for that potentially that it's it's very hard now to to start a project that could compete with these really successful players where, um, where the google of careers advice yeah now. Just... exactly like i mean again you can compare with with the market economy like the, the, there is this like drive towards you know monopoly in economies like you saw that in the us in the 19th century you know you had rockefeller in in oil and you know you had other and monopolies and then what the the government did was actually that like they, they went in and regulate this and like you know, perhaps we should do the same. We should break up. <laughs> Bring in the antitrust to break exactly, up the Center for Effective Exactly, altruism. and then you should have like, you know, another 80,000 80, hours with sort of like, you know, a, a counterpart Rob, perhaps, mm. like, you know, having a bizarro podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure whether I think that there's too many organizations starting up or too few. There's definitely benefits from having more organizations because more people can try different things yeah. and different perspectives yeah. get, get a greater yeah. audience. On the other hand, you also get benefits from having, you know, proper scale. So you can, uh, when when 80,000 hours was just one or two people, uh, you know, you have to spend so yeah. much time just keeping yeah. things running that it's very yeah. hard to uh, to grow. I mean, for, for, for a dominant organization, we only have seven people. So it's still a very small organization yeah. in, a, in a way. People must be surprised when you say that. <laughs> Isn't that the case? Well, uh I hope the audience is impressed, but I, uh-huh. I, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll leave other people to judge right. how well we're doing. But uh, like definitely with seven people, you have a much um, better. It's just become, everything becomes a lot more efficient because you uh, can write one person can write an article, and then you've got someone else who really knows how to how to get the word out there and to market it properly and make sure that people see it. So you get all of these benefits from specialization within the organization that you couldn't get if you if we split into two. And also potentially if you have a lot of new organizations starting, some good idea, uh, some good ideas get tried that otherwise wouldn't have, uh, you know, gotten a hearing. On the other hand, uh, people can do kind of silly things. You could you could start an organization that represents effective altruism badly or just has a bad strategy and, and waste resources. So it's a little bit unclear like where the ideal balance is between lots of new organizations starting and that kind of churn, and also just having professionalization and ensuring that the the best managed organizations can grow to a to a decent scale. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. So I wasn't actually saying so much with regards to like, you know, how many organizations we should actually have. I was just saying like as a, as a prediction, I, I was just wrong. And, uh, yeah. uh, and I think it's, actually, it's very important regardless of what you think about the normative question. It's very important to have accurate beliefs about, mm-hmm. the, you know, the predictive question because then you, you will sort of like tailor your, your strategy to whatever answers the right to that question. Yeah, it's very interesting to think what, what is the reason that more people aren't starting uh, new organizations? I suppose one thing I've been a little bit disappointed uh, at is that uh, not more people have started organizations in the developing world, you know, trying to do entrepreneurship with charities, mm-hmm. like taking 
really effective interventions that we know work and building an organization that, that scales them. Because I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities there and so many people who want to make uh, have a big impact on, on global poverty. Um, there, is, there is Charity Science Health, which is great. Uh, they're, they're doing vaccination reminders in, in India. And I think they're, they're now considering doing uh, some work to reduce anemia, I think iron supplementation, or some kind of uh, micronutrient supplementation, but I think they're, they're the only ones. I suppose it is a very it's a very difficult path to move country to the developing world and try to start an organization there on on the ground. But it would be interesting to to ask around and find out um, what is preventing people from starting new organizations and other reasons, good or bad. I mean, a good reason would be they think it's already covered. Other people are doing a great job. I guess a bad reason would be I don't know they, they feel like they they wouldn't be given the necessary assistance by other people or people would be uncooperative. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess. One common reason for why people don't start projects is that they don't really know how to go about it. It's like unclear what the path to impact would be and so on. But that can't really be the argument here because as you're saying, there we actually have like concrete interventions which are just waiting for someone to to implement them. So your master's is in political science and uh, you did an undergrad in philosophy and political science, is that right? Yeah, I have double uh, undergrad and master's in political science and philosophy. So do you think effective altruism should get more involved in in politics or should should we stay clear of it? Yeah, I definitely think that we should do policy and uh, on important questions like existential risk and uh, sort of like working in, in the background and, and give advice uh, uh, to politicians and so on. Uh, but if we're rather talking about more traditional party politics, uh, I think we should be quite wary to, to get involved in that, partly because of this like pulling the ropes sideways issue that many of the key political issues, they're not neglected at all. And also, I think this like politics is the mind killer issue uh, that I think that is really true. Uh, and I think I see that even if in effective altruists sometimes that people are... Who are Perhaps like, in me, Stefan? Um, I am you wouldn't silent. want to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm reasonable at all times, Stefan. That, that's the answer you are looking for. I have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, people who, who are res- um, who tend to be reasonable generally, like you know, they, there's something that happens when politics enters the, the picture, and I'm somewhat uh, worried about this. Uh, I was at some point a bit worried that effective altruists would develop into like fairly traditional progressive. The social movement and that, and you know, with the associated four epistemics, I, I think that risk mostly seems to have passed now. But I, th- I, I do think it's important to to emphasize, and I, I think in general, it's sort of people are sort of naturally tribal or tribalistic, uh, and they sort of you know they want to side with their own tribe and and they want to have other tribes to you know point finger against and they're always looking for divisions divisions even within their own group that they can uh get annoyed about yeah exactly so and i I don't think that we should have this attitude instead i think we should have broad visions with with unite people which unite people rather than which pit them against each other and i think potentially this fits uh, neatly with this long-term focus of so this vision of a great future for humanity could be could be such a vision. It could be appealing to people across the political spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, so I, I think this long-term focus uh, the, the, it has this great feature that it, it might work as this sort of a uniting feature. If you have a short-term focus, it might seem that... You know, There's you more should... trade-offs between exactly. different groups benefiting. Yeah. But if you're looking over a 100-year time scale, mostly we all get better or worse off together. Exactly. So, you know, we might go extinct together or we may, might build this great future uh, together. Just, just to push back on that for a little bit, it's true that as a, as a community or as a movement, we don't want effective altruism to just become basically, you know, a, an arm of some specific political party or some specific political agenda. But what about if, if 80,000 Hours was, was advising a young person who was very interested in politics and was interested in going into party politics and perhaps trying to get elected and trying to do good that way? Um, would, would you think that that's a bad idea, especially if they didn't try to bring like force the party politics onto the movement as a whole? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I distinguish between two cases. On the one hand, uh, there was this like giving expert advice on specific policy issues of great importance. And on the other hand, there was this like broad political campaigning. 
uh, and I was saying the first thing is is good, the, the second thing is not so good. What what you're now saying is something that's like a bit in between, I guess. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. I think uh, I, I would need to think more about it. It, it depends a bit like how it is framed i guess if if it gets this more like if this leads to 80k getting this sort of partisan image then that could potentially be bad i wouldn't expect that to happen but. i guess you might worry if too large a fraction of all of us were our jobs were in party politics that how that might change the the culture and the and the norms around you know having accurate beliefs and and always uh, you know saying what saying what you think even if it like doesn't benefit your party at that time yeah, and I could also see that, you know, five years down the line, who knows what EA will be like, and perhaps it will be the right call then. So so one thing I think is very important is to sort of like set the culture of EA right, and we want to have a, a culture where people have excellent epistemics, where people really care deeply about doing good in the world and are very thoughtful and reflective and I have worried that focusing on politics would sort of like have very bad cultural effects. But suppose that, you know, we are able to form a community of like really excellent people, both sort of like intellectually excellent and sort of morally excellent. And um, we, we have this excellent culture. Then perhaps these worries would go away and they, you know, they could enter politics and sort of like not be mind killed. Yeah. It's difficult. It's difficult, I think. Yeah. I mean, I feel it myself. I imagine that we all do, that once we start engaging in political issues, it's uh, very quickly you become very tribal and, and it's hard to hard to stay reasonable as you might on just purely scientific issues or something like that. So, yeah, but it's, it's a difficult balance to strike. Uh, although I do think we want to have at least some people, you know, involved in party politics. So at least we can we can experiment and find out, uh, do those ideas get any traction within party politics, like important ideas that are floating around the effective altruism community? Yeah, I think that has been tried to some extent, right? Yeah, there's been some people who've gone into politics in, in the UK and the US. It, it feels it's a little bit too early days to, to tell, uh, you know, how, how their careers will go and whether they'll be able to get any any influence to, to work on issues like existential risk or, you know, aid policy, that kind of thing. All right, so let's move on to these three pieces of research that you've uh, published over, over the last year. Uh, the first one is called Considering Considerateness, uh, Why Communities of Do-Gooders Should Be Especially Nice. Um, what was the case you were making there? I guess um, one reason was that many effective altruists are consequentialists. And consequentialists obviously don't think that there is any like intrinsic reason why you would follow social norms and so on. So social norms have to be evaluated on the basis of their outcomes, just as everything else. And that might prompt people to think that they should break norms and rules fairly frequently. Uh, but we wanted to, to push against that uh, and point out that this has this, all these like, invisible negative effects, which might be much less salient. So suppose that you want to increase uh, donations to uh, you know, some valuable target. Then it's very salient to you that, you know, lying about like how effective this is or like not even you know just distorting the truth about this that's going to have this like very salient additional impact whereas the negative effects of sort of like eroding trust in perhaps the ea community in general they're hidden from you yeah they're not so, yeah. not so obvious exactly and very hard to measure as well yeah so and basically then you're arguing you're arguing that those effects are quite large, I guess, and so that people should generally try to be extremely honest and, and very nice to one another. Yeah, that that is the claim. So I guess this point about how norm following is more important than what my, one might intuitively think, that's been made by many consequentialists all through the ages. Mm -hmm. But I guess our contribution was that we said that if you're part of a community of do-gooders, then these effects are stronger because then, you know, these negative reputational effects of dishonesty, they will not only affect you yourself, but also the whole community. And it will also like affect the internal culture of the movement negatively. Mm -hmm. So your point is if you're a movement of 10 people and, and one of you gilds the lily in order to get more donations, 
then you've just somewhat reduced uh, someone's trust in 10 people. But if you're 100 people, then the costs are 10 times as large because 100 is 10 times as many as 10. But the amount of extra donations you get is just the same. So it can become a, a lot less advantageous overall to uh, treat someone badly or to, to mislead them. Yeah, probably that's the case. So what are the, the kinds of considerateness that you're thinking of that, that are important here? We've mentioned dishonesty, but uh, are there other ones as well? Yeah, I think dishonesty is a key one. Especially as it's kind of the key selling point of yeah. effective altruism is to, to just the facts kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean, then there's also just uh, following sort of common sense norms more generally of sort of, you know, loyalty and friendliness and being respectful and so on. But uh, yeah, I think that the epistemic norms might be especially important. Mm -hmm. What about uh, just helping people out? So if people ask you for a favor, you know, should you do them a favor in order to build up the reputation of, the, of a community as being, being friendly? Yeah, that's a very good question because like that somewhat cuts against, can cut against uh, this uh, focus on like some people being disproportionately impactful. You know, on the basis of considerateness, you might think that like Nick Bostrom should spend a lot of time sort of writing letters of recommendations to everyone. But then, you know, you think about like his extreme impact and then you realize, you know, perhaps that's not a good uh, use of his time. So he shouldn't do that. So, so, yeah, so it's the tricky. more effective you are, the more you have license to be rude and dismissive to people to save your time. You, you could see how that could, could go wrong. Definitely. I'm not saying that he should be rude. I, I don't think he is rude. He's a, he's a nice person. But uh, I do think that... He, he should he, go out of his way to help yeah. people necessarily. Yeah. Interesting. So are there any particular kinds of inconsiderateness that, that you observe, that, you know, in people? I mean, because this issue has been discussed quite a lot, but I find it kind of interesting because I just don't notice people kind of being, being that inconsiderate or, or that dishonest. Uh, maybe this is happening in some parts of effective altruism that, that, I'm just, that I'm just not observing. But is there anything in particular you want to single out as something you'd like to see less of? Yeah, I don't want to single out like specific people or specific incidents, but I, I do think that this question about like uh, portraying impact accurately and like, you know, getting uncertainties across, it's very important. And I, I do think uh, that, you know, there's a huge risk that, you know, you you see that you could attract more donations. By exaggerating the effectiveness yeah. of your own organization or yeah. organizations that you particularly like. Yeah. yeah. And you were saying also uh, oversimplifying, like for example, sometimes 80,000 hours, we, we write things and we try to communicate something that's very complex and we try to make it a bit easier and you know reduce some of the complexity and the subtlety. Is that another thing that you might worry about? Sometimes, but I do think that that is definitely needed. And I do think I myself probably sometimes do the opposite thing where I sort of like have too many caveats and yeah. so on because I want to do this sort of epistemically diligent thing. So a related question is, uh, what should you do if you think that there's a particular cause that's very effective to work on, but a lot of the other people you know are working on, on other, or solving other problems that you think are significantly less effective? How much should you cooperate by, for example, telling one another about potential donors who might be interested in supporting you know, the, the other person's project or people who might be interested in working there versus, you know, try to hoard those and, and just keep them for yourself? Do you have any views on that? Yeah, I think this is somewhat related also to this issue of like EA focusing on sort of broad visions. I, I, I do think that we should in general have a cooperative culture where we uh, help each other. We should sort of incentivize that. So, you know, we should sort of celebrate when people do cooperate. At the same time, of course, like if you think that one cause is many times more important than another one, then it's natural to sort of, you know, privilege that course. So, yeah, it's a judgment call. But in general, I, I do want to emphasize cooperativeness. Yeah, that one comes up for me quite a lot because obviously I have, you know, views on which causes are yeah. more effective than others. And people are often asking me for favors of various different kinds or asking me for advice. And by and large, I will help them uh, regardless of, of what, what uh, problem they're, they're working to solve. And maybe it's just because, you know, you want to you be nice. So I'm just like rationalizing it. But I think it is good, good to set an example of being cooperative. And even if your help isn't directly useful because the, the problem that they're working on isn't so effective, at least you're creating good, good, uh, good cultural norms, which uh, could, be, could be really, val really valuable. And also then it means that people are inclined to help you back. So uh, 
it's that thing that you know be, being being selfless can can be can be very good for you in, in its own way because you have a better reputation yeah i think that's absolutely right and i think that's especially true of this like very you know, i mean quite small and tightly knit community it's very important to, to get a good reputation so that that's a, actually an important reason for being considerate so so what do you think is the the best reason to to be inconsiderate yeah, I mean, sometimes, of course, the payoff uh, from breaking norms can be very large. Uh, that, that, that's obviously true. And so, so, so you just kind of sometimes you just have to make a judgment call that it's worth, yeah, doing something that would ordinarily or ordinarily be wrong just because the payoff's so big. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, in you know, suppose that you have a norm that you should help people, and then you know you're Nick Bostrom, so you know you have a very high impact, then you could say that like, you know, he is being inconsiderate through not helping people with writing letters or recommendations. But I think that's not really the natural way of framing that. It's more like, you know, it's actually the right call for him. And, and yeah. uh, you know, he's not being inconsiderate. He's, he's just judging the situation accurately. And trying to set his priorities. Yeah. You can't help everyone. Yeah. yeah. What about What about this angle that... In a, in a community that uh, really prizes this kind of considerateness, it's possible that people would become so interested in not offending one another or being nice. This is a slightly different conception of, of considerateness. But if people are being want to be always very cooperative, then they might not just tell one another when they think that the thing that they're working on isn't very effective. So, for example, when come, someone comes to me and asks for advice on how to make a project that I don't think is, is very good, um, more effective... Uh, one thing I could say is, well, you just shouldn't work on this thing at all. You should quit completely. But that, in a way, feels a bit abrasive. It's not very friendly. Am I creating good cultural norms? But at the same time, that kind of bitter pill of like truth, or at least my opinion, uh, could could be really useful to people. Yeah, that's a very good question, and that also gives me sort of like the opportunity to expand a bit on the very term considerateness, because yeah. we had this like endless con- uh, discussions about like you know what title to use. I mean, I mean, I know that you also put a lot of effort into choosing the the right titles because it, you know, it colors people's reading of of a text. So what we wanted to say was not actually that it should be nice. That was not the claim. But rather that you should like follow norms, uh, and perhaps we should have chosen a different title uh, because like people interpreted this as a claim about niceness. I think in this case that you mentioned, it's actually you know this trade-off situation between two different norms, like norms of, of niceness or friendliness and norms of honesty. Because what you're doing there, if you're not telling them, that is basically that you're being like slightly dishonest. You know, you're not lying, perhaps, but you, you know, you don't want to hurt their feelings, and and there, I think probably that you know, honesty should, you know, to quite a large extent, trump a sort of like niceness, and like if someone isn't effective, then you might sometimes have to tell them that. And in a, in a way, I guess that that is considerate because yeah. you're, you're telling you one, you're being honest, but also you're giving them information that could be very useful in a sense, even if they don't like it at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, someone made this comment that, uh, you know, what we should care about is like people's long term interest. And, you know, sometimes that might in the short term, like create emotional pain. And, you know, you, you're telling them that their project isn't working. Mm. But you know, it's, it's a bit like if you're in a relationship that's not working out and it can be very painful to break up with someone, but it might well be even in their long term interest. Yeah. yeah. So on this issue of following norms. Uh, there's been this uh, debate that's come up a bit, on, a bit online before. D- is following should we follow the correct norms or should we follow whatever norms exist and how much and how much should we question them? So one view might be uh, we should follow the norms of society no matter what they are, even if they're even if they're flawed, because basically people are going to judge us by by that standard. Another might be we should come up with our own norms. We should like reason things through and try to improve on society's norms. And then we should follow those ones. So, for example, if society has a particular standard of honesty that's reasonable but not extremely high, then you might say, well, that's the, that's the standard of honesty that we should follow. On the other hand, you might say, no, we should like set an internal norm that's far above that and then judge people by this, by this different and superior standard. I don't mean superior as in higher. I just mean like better according to our reasoning process. Do you have any view on, on that? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, I probably think that 
on questions which are of like special importance for effective altruism, there we should probably develop new norms. So like anything that has to do with epistemics, there we really should think through which norms we want to have and, and then, you know, follow those norms. And they, you know, we might require more evidence than one would normally require. But then there are sort of like all sorts of other everyday norms which are sort of somewhat more removed from the EA core mission. And there you might think that, well, you know, it's just a lot of work of sort of trying to develop new norms and getting people to follow them. So why it's just the cheapest solution to just go with the mainstream norm. Which is what people outside the community would be judging us on anyway. Yeah, you, I I think that is right. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with that answer, but it seems like it seems like a tricky one. All right, let's let's move on to the uh, second uh, piece that you put out, which is uh, called "Hard to Reverse Decisions Destroy Option Value." An absolutely striking viral title there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, what what did you have to say in that blog post? Uh, that's funny that you say that. Yeah, we also changed that title uh, over and over again. Uh, I agree, it's not the most striking title. Yeah, I I guess uh, the thought was there that it's very easy to, if, you, if you're not careful, it's easy to go down paths which are hard to reverse or even irreversible and that this consideration might be more important than, than, you, than you think. And we also had like some specific examples in mind. So... Uh, going political, for instance, might be a decision which is very hard to reverse, whereas if we stay more like removed from party politics, we will always have the, the, the choice to, mm. to become more political. And but, similarly, like if we're small and like, you know, then we, we have the option of growing large, but uh, you know, the, 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 the reverse doesn't hold. Yeah. Are there any other examples of things where it's kind of a, a one way trip that uh, once you've gone somewhere, it's very hard to turn it back? Yeah, so the, the third example that we had was exactly this about a reputation for considerateness, a reputation for, for integrity and, and friendliness and so on. That like, you know, I think we have that to a reasonable extent now, but if you started like caring less about that, that would be very hard to reverse. Yeah. So that- uh, it reminds me of that quote from uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, Creditworthiness is a bit like virginity. It's very easy to lose and uh, very hard to win back. So in a sense, once you become known for being a jerk and, and lying, it's very hard to convince people that you're, that you're honest and decent person. That's a great quote. I'll, uh, I'll put up a link to, to that blog post about uh, irreversible decisions and uh, people can have a read for themselves if they want to learn more. So uh, the third piece of research that you put out is called uh, Understanding Cause Neutrality. And cause neutrality is this term that uh, people use to suggest that someone is uh, open to working on solving a, a wide range of, of different problems uh, and potentially that they'll be willing to change uh, to working on whichever one they think will do the most good. What are the misconceptions that you think people have about uh, cause neutrality? Yeah, so, yeah, as you said, cause neutrality is just this idea that you should be willing to consider new causes and because, like, unless you're lucky uh, you might have you know chosen intuitively a course which is not the most effective and, and it might actually be many times less effective than the most impactful course if it's the case that like the distribution of, of impact across courses is, is very uneven so i think one misconception is that people think that some people might think that course neutrality entails that we should work on this like broad range of different courses. So course neutrality sets EA apart from other movements. Other movements like the feminist movement or the environmentalist movement are arguably aren't, aren't course neutral. But another thing which sets EA apart is that it's working on a number of different courses. So in the paper we call this course divergence. Um, but but it doesn't actually follow from, from course neutrality that we should be course divergent because it could very well be that we should invest all our resources in, in one course, the very best course. So I, I think that is an important point. So we, we, where you sometimes see people misunderstanding that. Are there any other misconceptions about course neutrality? 
Yeah, I guess yet another concept which I introduce is this, con- which is like related to to cause divergence, is this concept of cause agnosticism that you're sort of uncertain about uh, which cause is the most important. So that sometimes people have used um, the, the term cause neutrality to, to refer to to cause agnosticism. But, but you want to say that someone could be cause neutral, but very sure about what's the best cause to work on. And uh, they think that all of effective actions should just be focused on that one cause. That that's how you want to use the term. Yeah, yeah, definitely. interesting. Uh, but do you think that kind of outcome is is likely if someone were truly cause neutral? Because if I met someone who was really sure that they knew which problem was most effective to work on, I might start to wonder, you know, do they really know, or are they just being very overconfident? And maybe they, you know, have pre commitments to particular to particular problems that they think are going to be most effective, just because the problem seems so difficult to answer in the first place. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I guess there's a continuum here. So one should always be willing to, to change one's mind, but what, you don't have to go so far as to be like, you know, agnostic. Like you, you might think that one cause is likely to be uh, the most important, but you're still open to, to changing your mind. And do you think potentially that effective altruism maybe should be focused on a, on a more narrow range of problems? I find that like not implausible so like people have talked about course x uh, and like some people have thought perhaps that you know there should be very many different courses but perhaps just like you know the number of organizations hasn't grown that fast similarly the number of courses hasn't grown that fast and perhaps it's just the case that you know some courses are much more important uh, like existential risk and we should focus on them and we already know about them yeah you mentioned this concept of uh, course x what, what what's what's that so cause X would be this unknown cause which we don't know about yet. Yeah. So it's like trying to give a name to kind of some unknown thing that yeah. would be really effective and yeah. encourage people to, exactly. to try to figure out what it was. It's a bit, a bit of a mystery. Yeah. But I suppose since that term came into use, I haven't really heard that many. Uh, I suppose there's, there's, a bit, there's been some suggestions, uh, but none of them has really caught fire. Yeah. So I guess if we're not finding new ones, then maybe we actually already know the, the ones that are like likely to be the best would be yeah. the argument. And uh, I mean, those who, who prioritize existential risk, they might say that, like, you know, when did Bostrom come up with this Maxipoc rule that we, which essentially means that we should focus on existential risk? That was quite a few years ago, right? And, uh, I think almost twenty years, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that I that I really buy that because I just think there's so much deep uncertainty about the nature of the world and you know how the future might go. Mm-hmm. I suppose. If you think about existential risk as just this very broad class of problems of trying to make the long run future go better, then maybe maybe it's likely that the the, the best problem to work on is is in that class. But it's a ve- but then you've created a very broad uh, set of things that and many different problems could potentially fall into that. So in a way, you've cheated to get the answer. Um, yeah, I think that's an important point because this is another concept which there is some um, there are some misunderstandings about the, the notion of existential risk. Uh, so. I think, or existential risk reduction, I think that many EAs sort of equate that with, you know, uh, AI safety work, biosecurity work, and uh, perhaps AI strategy work, but it could encompass also like this, like broader, you know, social, institutional changes or improvements that make civilization uh, more resilient. That, those are, that's not the most you know, popular approach to reducing existential risk now, but it's one possible approach. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty on board with the argument that shaping the long-term future is the best way to, to do the most good. Uh, but, I'm not, but I'm not sure about that either. There, there, there are arguments on the other side, both like philosophical arguments and, and practical arguments. And while a lot of people have been con- convinced of this, not, not everyone is. So kind of if you're trying to be uh, humble, epistemically humble, as we were talking about earlier, then you should retain, you know, a reasonable level of doubt about whether that, that's actually true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, and I suppose people differ on this. E- even when I feel reasonably confident about something, I almost always just want to adjust back and say, you know, I almost never want to be more than 80% confident about any complex question just because there's so many things that I might not have considered. Uh, so many things that it might not even be possible for a human to, to really think about. And I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, uh, what is the nature of the universe and uh, things could be very, like the world could be very different than, than, than what I understand, in which case I could be wrong about lots of practical questions. Uh, so for that reason, I always just want to like say, in a sense, I have all of these these answers to practical questions that I'm going to operate on day to day. But in a deep sense, I'm just very uncertain about what's going on and what I want to do. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's not not always easy to to live that. At least when you're in conversation, all of the temptation is to be overconfident. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the thing. But it, it's also the case that you just you have to act, right? Uh, and uh, and you know, effective altruism is very focused on action. And when when you act very decisively, it might seem as if you're more convinced than you actually are. So I think it's important then to what what you're effectively saying is that. I'm very unsure of, you know, what's actually the right thing to do, but, you know, I, I, I need to try to have an impact in the world and I, I will try to do that in this decisive way, even though, you know, I assign some probability that, you know, my actions aren't having the impact that I think that they will have. Yeah, I can't just lie in bed forever worrying that we don't have a solution to the problem of induction. At some point, <laughs> you, you, you got to get amongst it and just hope that induction does actually work. <laughs> well, uh, my guest today has been uh, Stefan Schivert. Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Stefan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. We're always keen to grow the show's audience by getting the word out there to people who would find it useful to listen to. So if you know someone who would, it would be excellent if you could send them a text with a link to the show so they can check it out and consider subscribing. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.